to see if he would qualify for the ministry. So the bishop looked at him and said this. He said, well, Sam, will you tell me the parable of the good Samaritan? Yes, sir, I will, sir. Once there was this man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among the thorns. And the thorns sprung up and choked him. And as he went on, he didn't have any money, and so he met the queen of Sheba. And she gave him a thousand talents of gold and a hundred changes of raiment. And he got into a chariot and drove furiously, and when he was driving under that big juniper tree, his hair got caught on the limb of that tree, and he hung there many days and many nights. And the ravens brought him food to eat and water to drink. And he ate 5,000 loaves of bread and two fishes. <laughs> One night when he was hanging there his, asleep, his wife Delilah come along and cut off his hair. And he dropped and fell on stony ground, but he got up and went on and began to rain, and it rained 40 days and 40 nights. And he hid himself in a cave and lived on locusts and wild honey. <laughs> then he went on till he met a servant who said, come take supper at my house. And he made excuse and said, no, I won't. I've married a wife and I can't go. And the servant went out in the highways and the hedges and compelled him to come in. After supper he went on and come on down to Jericho. And when he got there he looked up and saw that old queen Jezebel sitting way up high in a window. And she laughed at him and he said, throw her down out there. And they threw her down. And he said, throw her down again. And they threw her down 70 times 7. <laughs> And of the fragments that remained, they picked up 12 baskets full beside women and children. And they said, blessed are the peacemakers, P-I-E-C-E. -E. Now whose wife do you think she will be on that judgment day? You know what? You really have to know the scriptures to get the gist of that story. But it is one messed up story. It's a story that's taken from bits and fragments of here and there and everywhere to make a marvelous story, but it is not the real story. It's a story made up by some guy trying to get an ordination, having missed the scriptures completely. I will suggest to you that maybe five or ten years from now, if I read that in an average congregation, many might not even get it, because you have to know the real story in order to get the perversion of it. And the biblical narrative is very clear in the stories that it tells. Amen to that. That was, certainly was a messed up story, wasn't it? <laughs> We're going to start this morning in Deuteronomy chapter 8. You know, our enemy loves to twist and distort things. He likes to, to get us out of context of God's story and kind of retell the story in his own words. Of course, if you've been, we are, uh, you're probably going to notice that we went Luke 1, Luke 2, and we're going Luke 4. There's a reason for that, and we're, we're going to let you find it. But for the third week in a row, we're going to talk about Luke, and we're going to start out by not, by not talking about the book of Luke from the beginning. You know, that, that being said, that story, anything I tell you from up here... Anything you hear from any preacher or anywhere, any pastor, even that was a story about somebody who was going for their ordination. Does that make you feel comfortable? Um, man, get, get into the scriptures, get into prayer, and ask for the Holy Spirit's guidance. Uh, I can't give you my relationship with God. You know, I could lead you astray on purpose or on accident. I could tell you something wrong. You know, so I really want to emphasize that you, you know, everything that I share with you just for the sake of time on a Sunday morning, I can't give you entire chapters, and try to make sure everything is in context. So all I can do is ask you to trust God first, and then me, and then go in in your own time and dig in and read the passages I give you in their context to make sure whether or not you're hearing the truth or not. It's just, you know, it's our, our do, do duty, or whatever, do, that's, not, that's not a phrase, is it? But anyway, we're going to start off in Deuteronomy chapter 8. <clears throat> the children of Israel have been led into the wilderness uh, God says in, in there in uh, chapter 8, verse 1, Every commandment which I command you today, you must be careful to observe that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land of which the Lord swore to your fathers. And you shall remember that the Lord, your God, led you all, all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and to test you. And why did he lead them there? To humble and to test you. To know what was in your heart. Now, is this for God to know what was in our heart? Or is this for us to figure out what's in our heart, you think? Uh, whether you would keep his commandments or not. So he humbled you and allowed you to hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, 
but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So if you're familiar with the story, you know, the, the Israelites were complaining and grumbling against God because they were starving. They were led out into the wilderness to be tested, and even though God was giving them bread for heaven, if you continue on with the story, they continued to complain and grumble. But God had kind of forced them into this position to where they were having to trust Him for their, their life, for their substance, the very core thing about uh, life for them. You know, you have to eat and breathe and, and get water to survive, right? So even the bare necessities of life, God was asking them to trust. And, of course, you know the rest of the story, we failed. You know, Satan, the Scripture says a lot of things about him. Um, number one, that he's a thief and a liar from the beginning. Right? He's come to steal, kill, and destroy. And that he's a predator. He's like a prowling lion. He's searching about, sneaking around, looking to pick one of us off and to destroy us. He's also an accuser and a twister of God's word. Now, one of his main jobs is to, to de- is to defile you, to try to make you look bad in God's eyes as an accuser, and to try to make God look bad in your eyes. He's trying to, yeah, he's trying to, to distort the image you have of God for you, and then vice versa. Are we created in the image of God? And I, I don't know if that drawing that was up there of me earlier was the image that God had in mind when he created me in his image, but it, it, was, it was a pretty good one. I'd shed a few pounds, it looks like, but it was a, it was a good rendition of me, I think. But if we're going to, temptation, you know, I, I think about the Lord's Prayer where he says, lead us not into temptation, but when we start off Luke, it says he was led by the Spirit and, to be tempted. And the Scripture also tells us that God doesn't tempt anyone. So it, it, gets, it gets hard to deal with it. We, we, are these contradicting to each other or are we understanding them wrong? Does God allow us to be tempted by Satan to test us so we will know what's really in our heart, whether we're going to choose the right or choose the wrong? I want to, we're going to take a look at Genesis 1 this morning, and we're going, to, we're going to get to know our enemy through the lens of Scripture and try to take a look at some of the tactics that he uses against us. Then we're going to look at Jesus when he's tempted to the first of Luke 4 and to see what it was that he had that sometimes that we seem like we don't have when we're faced with a hard temptation, when we're faced with a test, and seeing whether or not we should go right or go left. And a lot of times... We don't make that right decision, but we're going to look at what Jesus had that helped him to always make that right decision. This is Jesus as a man. I know it's an easy answer to say, well, he was God. He, you know, he just used his power when we weren't looking and behind his cloak of flesh. And that's, I don't believe that was the case. Genesis chapter 3, I'm going to start in verse 1. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said... And I've got the NIV up here um, because it's translated a little bit differently, a little bit more clearly. It said, did God really say that? How long did it take him? How long did it take him to try to question what what God had said and try to twist what God had said? They knew the words God had commanded them about not eating of the tree in the garden of good and evil, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He knew what he'd said, but Satan, is, is, did God really say that? Is that really what he meant? Right? Already, he's trying to twist the Scriptures. He's trying to twist the Word of God to make it mean what he wants it to mean in the woman's eyes. And ladies, I'm not picking on you. I'm just, this is just how the story's written. <laughs> and the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden... God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. What does the serpent do again? Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some, and she ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Right? And then the blame game ensues, right? The woman gave it to me. Well, the, the beast tempted me. The story about Saul, when he fell out of favor with God, the king saw that David followed up. When he disobeyed God, he started passing the blame game on. Well, there's three things that happen here. One, Satan tw- twists twist the word of God. Says, Is that what God really meant? Is that what he really said? The next thing he, he, he went after them about 
was pleasure and comfort. Pleasure and comfort. When she saw that the fruit was good to eat, that it would be pleasing, she took of, she took of the fruit and ate. So Satan is always on us about comfort and pleasure. Comfort and pleasure. He uses pleasure to get us to do the things that we're not supposed to do, and he uses comfort to keep us from doing the thing that God wants us to do that might make us a little bit uncomfortable. Is that not true? Is that not true? Here's what happens to us, one of the things that, as we fail when it comes to temptation, no matter what it is, and you can look at drug addiction, any sort of addiction, addiction to pornography, anything like that, what happens with an addiction is this is that people began to chase, and, any, and I've been addicted to more than one thing. You start to chase a feeling, and you start to lose your humanity. You start to ch- chase a feeling, and to lose your humanity. We're created in the image of God, and Satan's doing all that he can, and that's the best way he can do it, to start to secure that image. Satan also played on their insecurity and their inferiority. He made them feel inferior, and he made them insecure that God was holding something out on them. God was withholding information. He was trying to hold them down by not really giving them true power and true knowledge. Then we had the knowledge of good and evil. What does that mean? It's like, hey, you can decide good and evil for yourself. And whatever you think is good is good, and whatever you think is evil is evil. Are we beginning to see that? Can you see that in the world around us today? So he's going to play on our trust in God and his word and try to get us to doubt that. He's going to try to get us to not trust God and to trust ourselves, and by relation we're trusting him, really. He's going to play on our pleasures and our comforts. He's going to throw, you know, Jan and I are trying to do the Atkins diet. And every time I see a potato chip, every time, of course there's more Dairy Queen commercials on now than there have ever been in the history of Dairy Queen because I'm trying to stay away from that temptation. Right? It's going to come after you and playing on my pleasure. When I stand up here and I feel like God wants me to say something really powerful, I don't want anybody to be mad at me. I want to be comfortable up here. I want everybody to tell me, smile and tell me I get a good job and, and then somehow be convicted and repent without me saying what I was supposed to say and all that sort of thing. I was, uh, I've, I've been making a big mistake in my prayer life for a, quite some time now. When I began to teach and then... It's turned into standing up and preaching on Sundays. Um, usually when I'm, when I'm dealing with some sort of repentance that I have to have, I've had some sort of failure with what God didn't want me to do or what he did want me to do. It didn't really matter. And I would say this, and this is where I realize I've really messed up, and I'm going to try to show you this in Scripture too, is that I, w- I would say, God, if you're going to cast me away at the end of it, if I'm not going to make it, um, at least use me. I want to be used as a tool to help other people to get to you if I can't be there. And I thought that was a really humble, really noble prayer, but I, what I realized that Satan had absolutely tried to get in between me and God and try to make me think that my relationship with God shouldn't be the most important thing in my life. That yours should. Now, that's still important to me, but I was, I was way off. And I just realized that praying before the service today. Um, that, he's really, that all his ultimate goal is to get us to turn away from God and to live in shame, to live in fear, to live in doubt, and not worry about a relationship with God at all. Now let's go look at Luke chapter 4, verses 1 through 14. Verse 1, then Jesus being filled with the Holy Spirit. That's the number one clue right there. That's, that's the number one thing, or one of the main things that we have got to have to overcome temptation. Returned from the Jordan, he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Now, where were they in Deuteronomy? In the wilderness. It's ironic. Well, not ironic, but it's, it's pretty awesome in an ironic kind of way. I'm wrestling with my words this morning. Being tempted for 40 days by the devil, and in those days he ate nothing, and afterwards, when they had ended, he was hungry. Now, there's a difference here. The children of Israel were made to live with no food, even though, right, and then God provided them the food so he could show them that. Jesus would have had access to food, but because of his obedience and his love for his Father and to, and to do what he was supposed to do, he intentionally went without food for 40 days and 40 nights. And in those days he ate nothing, and afterwards, when they had ended, he was hungry. 40 days. I've gone 
about six hours without eating, and I'm hungry. <laughs> this is 40 days, so he's pretty hung- He's probably hangry by this point, but, you know, be hangry and do not sin. And the devil said to him, if you are the son of God, command this stone to become bread. But Jesus answered him, saying, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Took, taken right from Deuteronomy chapter 8, which... Deuteronomy seems to be Jesus, it's not, I, if you go by how many times he quoted what book, Deuteronomy was definitely one of his favorites, if you can judge that in that way. But Jesus said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. What was Satan playing on here? Being hungry for 40 days was probably not very comfortable. And being able to get some food, right, would have given, me, given him some security, he was also wanting him to use his power, which would have made him look great and would have made him look powerful, but he would also have been what? Fracturing his relationship with his father. Then the devil took him up on a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, All this authority I will give to you and their glory, for this has been delivered to me, and I will give it to whomever, whomever I wish. And you think, well, no, this is God's world. He can't actually do that. If you look in Revelation, though, Revelation 13, he's actually given this authority. But what parts of the world is he given that over? <clears throat> For this has been delivered to me, and I will give it to whomever I wish. Delivered to him by whom? Therefore, you will worship before me, and all this will be yours. And Jesus said to him again, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and only him shall you serve. So what is, what is Satan playing on there? That power. That power is actually one I left out. But power, the desire for power, for our own power, is actually born out of insecurity and a feeling of inferiority. When we don't feel like we're secure, what do we want to do? We want to grab power. That's what the world tells you all the time. Fear and power. Fear and power. You should be afraid of the Muslims. You should be afraid of your government. You should be afraid of this kind of food. You should be afraid of this. And the thing is you should do about this fear is to go get more power. Go grab more power for yourself rather than trusting in God and His power. Then He brought him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, notice He's always challenging the Son of God part. If you're the Son of God, throw yourself down from here for it is written, He will give His angels charge over you to keep you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. What is Satan quoting there? He's quoting scripture from Psalm ninety-one, twelve. Satan knows everything that's in this book. He's trying to twist it out of context for you. Has anybody ever looked through the scriptures to try to justify something you wanted to do that you, the Holy Spirit was already telling you you didn't need to do? If I want to, I can go back here and say, well, you know. Uh, you know, Abraham had a baby with his servant's woman. Uh, David was a man after God's own heart, and he did all this stuff, and he was still okay. And well, I can start to find excuses. I can start saying, hey, all this stuff, I can decide good and evil for myself, and I can even make it biblical. So Satan is trying to twist that. And, I, and I'm thinking, you know, in verse 14, right after this happened, it says, Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and news from him went out, went out throughout all the surrounding regions. So I don't think this was done in a vacuum. I think what was going on here was seen. And one of the things, if he would have thrown himself off of that building and the angels would have come down and swooped him up and saved him, just like the scripture had promised or scripture had said it would, think about what all the people would have thought. You know? I mean, Satan could say, hey, you know, you make this big spectacle. Everybody will know you're the son of God then. And um, they see this great miracle and they see these great things happen and they'll, I mean, they'll be all yours. And it sounds like a great thing. And we're going to talk about miracles here in a couple of weeks. But what would Jesus have been doing? He would have been testing his father. He would have been testing him. Not in the way that Gideon was, when Gideon was doubting himself and thinking, you know, I want to make sure this is what you want me to do. This is, I'm taking a big risk here. This is the, that would have been the ultimate act of unbelief, even though it seems like a trusting, like a, a good God trust fall to jump off and see if God's going to catch me. But really, how untrusting would he have had to have been? 
to do that. Think about it for a minute. How untrusting and how, what an act of unbelief it would have been for him to do that. If my children know that they can trust me, they don't have to test me to see whether or not I'm going to catch them if they fall. They're going to know I'm going to. They don't need to, they don't need to do that to me. And sometimes they do because I don't do right all the time. And they, they can't, unfortunately, they can't always trust me to come through with what I said. I'm, I hope my daughter's not listening back there. <laughs> Did you see that? You see the difference? Now, Jesus did miracles, but what were the point of the miracles? Right? Jesus didn't come to do miracles. He did miracles so we would know who he was. So Satan is always trying to get in between us and God. He's trying to turn us away to look away from God. Adam and Eve ran and hid when all of that happened. Because they'd been tricked. So, so what can we do? We've got to trust God in his word. When we're tempted, number one, we've got to trust that what God said is wrong is wrong, and what God said is right is right. Right? There are plenty of black and white areas in our life where we know that the scripture has said, don't do this. The scripture said, go do this. Right? But what about those times that it's kind of gray? You know? Does God want me to go to school here? Does God want me to go talk to this? Does God want me to go eat at this? Whatever it is that we pray about. We should pray about everything we do. But there's big decisions in life that are, hey, one is, excuse me, one is just, just as Christian as another one. Uh, that's when we need the help of the Holy Spirit to guide us. And really, when we trust our conscience, that's the way that he will speak to you the most is through your conscience. And a lot of times, and this is one of the things I go by, but when it comes to what I'm going to say in here, I think about this. If I'm doubting if I should say a certain thing or do a certain thing from here, if, I think, if I'm thinking, the only thing I can think is I'm afraid people will get mad at me, then I'm probably right on with God. If I'm worried about what God's going to think about what I say, then I need to rethink it. Does that make any sense? Then part of the new covenant is that God's laws and commandments are written, taken from stone and written on our hearts. So God may be true and every man a liar. I mean, every one of us really, really know. Has anybody ever faced, made the wrong decision when you came to a temptation and, re- and really not known what the right thing to do was? I can forget later. I can try to justify later what I did and then maybe start to believe my own story. But, I, but we really, really do know. We can, we can trust our instinct. We, we usually, most of the time, our conscience will bear witness on which way we ought to go. So I want to finish today on trusting in the Holy Spirit, trusting God and His Word, but the main thing is to pray, pray, pray. To keep having that conversation with God and to keep getting closer and closer and closer so we can trust our instincts more, so we can, we can know that we're doing right, even though we, we know when we're doing right and wrong, but we really, it's really a lot more, a lot more powerful is what I want to say. Well, Let's look what Jesus did. Now, this, was, this wasn't the only time that he was really tempted in a major way. Before he was delivered up to die, to suffer and die on the cross for you and me, when he prayed, he had you and me in mind specifically. But before that, what, let's look at what happens here. Verse 39, coming out he went to the Mount of Olives and was, as he was accustomed, and his disciples also followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, pray that you might not enter into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Then an angel came from heaven and strengthened him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. You know, uh, I think about that sometimes. Like, we prayed, why wasn't he praying earnestly the first time? <laughs> you know, this is Jesus here. But he prays more earnestly. Then sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. This is an actual medical condition, believe it or not. Hematidrosis or something. I'm trying to be a scientist now. I need to quit. I'm on my head. Then he said to them, why do you sleep? Rise and pray unless you what? Unless you enter into temptation. So pray, pray, 
pray. So God, we go back to the two biggest failures, the 40 days in the wilderness. You go where Jesus was given this last prayer before he was delivered up? In the garden. He was in a garden where we messed up the first time. Temptation's a hard thing to deal with. And there's something, each and every one of us has something that we brought in here today that we're wrestling with with God. Each and every one of us. We've got something, maybe it's a feeling we're chasing that's eating away at our humanity and we know it. Maybe it's something God wants us to do rather than not something he doesn't want us to do that we've been putting off and we've been putting off and the urgency and the voice is getting quieter and quieter and my comfort zone is getting louder and louder when really inside I'm not comfortable at all. Now Satan's going to lie to you this morning. He's going to tell you you're okay. You'll stay right where you are. Just stop moving. Right? Don't put away that addiction. Don't go volunteer. Don't share the faith with your friend. Why? Because he wants to steal, kill, and destroy. And he wants to destroy the image of God in your life where other people can't see it at all. I'm going to read you as they, the band gets ready to play this next song. I'm going to read you a scripture. And I'm not going to comment on it at all. I just want you to take in God's word here. In Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 20. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the evil day, having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you are able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end, with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And for me that utterance and for me that utterance may be given to me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I'm an ambassador in change chains that in it I may speak boldly as though I ought to speak. So if you're, you're feeling the call this morning, don't be lied to. I'm going to let the band play and I'll be down here for you if you need to come.